This is the story of Emirates Flight 131. Now, Emirates is a weird carrier. When the Airbus A380 came out, no one else really liked it. But Emirates was like, you know what, I'll take your entire stock. It's not an exaggeration to say that the A380 program lived and died with Emirates. They're the largest operator of the type, and it's not even close. But with such a large plane, you have to ask yourself, what would happen if one of these crashed? And on the 10th of September 2017, one almost did. The largest passenger jet almost hit the ground. On that day, an Airbus A380 was on its way from Dubai to Moscow's Domo de Devo International Airport with 422 passengers and 22 crew members on board. Nothing of note happened during the flight, and as the plane got closer to the runway, the air traffic controller decided to switch things up for the Airbus A380. The controller wanted to send the plane on a different approach than the one that had been set up in the flight plan. Now, let's just get this clear. This is nothing weird. Things like this happen all the time. Operational reasons dictate a change in approach all the time. Sometimes it's weather, sometimes it's traffic, sometimes it's just a way to reduce noise in and around the airport. For whatever reason, the controller sent the A380 towards runway 14 right. As the plane got closer to runway 14 right, the controller allowed flight 131 to descend down to 500 meters, or about 1600 feet above the terrain, at the pilot's discretion. The pilots decided to go for it. In the cockpit, the altitude knob was changed from 3300 feet to 2300 feet. The pilots also put the huge plane in a left bank to line it up with the runway. As the plane slowed, the flaps and slats came out, the gear came out, and the world's largest plane was configured for landing. As Flight 131 reached the final approach point for this approach, the controller tried to hand the plane off to the tower controller, but the crew of Flight 131 never responded. The controller now noticed that Flight 131 was losing altitude very fast. They were well below the 500 meter lower limit that he had set for them. He tried to warn them, but the plane kept descending. He repeated his instructions three times before the A380 finally pulled up. They were nowhere near the runway and they were less than 1,000 feet from the ground. In the cockpit, the pilots pushed the four throttles to the max and in a few moments, the huge A380 from descending at 2,000 feet per minute to climbing at 2,500 feet per minute. As they were bottoming out, the EGPWS or the Enhanced Ground Proximity Warning System started going off, letting them know that they were dangerously low. At this point, they were 7.3 nautical miles from the runway. They should have been at a few thousand feet, not the 474 feet that they were at. Thankfully, the pilots were able to carry out a go-around. As the controller set the plane up for attempt number two, the controller asked the crew if they were ready to make the final left turn to line up with the runway. At the point of the left turn, the pilots were maintaining 3,300 feet, but the crew felt that the approach was off and then they called for another go around. Thankfully, this time much earlier than the one before. So the A380 was in no danger right now, but they had just carried out two go arounds. The plane climbed to 3,000 feet and then they started the procedure all over again for the approach to runway 14 right. Hopefully, third time would be the charm. Thankfully, it was. The plane landed with no issues whatsoever and all on board were safe. Now, here's the thing about the A380 that I find interesting. The plane is so large that most airports can't even accommodate the plane. So where does it divert to if it does need to divert? If you're in a 737 or an A320, it can't be that hard to find a runway to land on. Hell, if you're desperate, you can just land on the ground. Some pilots have done that. But where the hell do you land an A380? There can be a whole lot of airports that can support the A380. So what do pilots do? If you know, let me know in the comments below. Thank you to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Now, you don't need me to tell you that you need a VPN. As they say, data is the new oil, and tons of companies are out to get yours. Atlas VPN is a great way to keep that from happening. Use Atlas VPN. Keep all of your weird Google searches just to yourself. No one needs to know what you search. Wink, wink. On top of all of that, Atlas VPN lets you watch Netflix shows that might not be available in your country. Me personally, I love Rick and Morty, but it's not on Netflix where I live. But that's not an issue with Atlas VPN. In addition to that, it's an amazing deal. At just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee, what are you waiting for? Let me put that another way. 
that's an 82% discount. That means that you can grab Atlas VPN for just $1.99 a month for three years. Join 6 million people who are using Atlas VPN to keep their browsing private. Grab Atlas VPN special deal for 82% off with the link in the screen or in the description. Again, thank you to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. So now the question is, how did the world's largest plane almost slam into a Russian city? What the hell happened here? The first thing to note is that the airspace around Domodedovo airport was quite congested that night. And the controller at the airport was talking to Russian planes in Russian. And he was using English with two planes, one of them being Emirates Flight 131. But here's the thing. This meant that the pilots of Flight 131 did not have a really good idea as to who was in the area and who wasn't. This led to Flight 131 getting a bit too close to one of the planes in the vicinity, to the point where the pilots of Flight 131 had to slow down to maintain separation with the other plane. After the almost conflict was resolved, the controller then set the plane up for the approach to runway 14 right. He let them descend down to 500 meters or about 1500 feet, at their discretion. Throughout all of this, the plane was under the control of the autopilot. The altitude hold mode, the heading mode, and the speed mode were all locked and active throughout this phase of flight. Then once the airplane was closer to the airport, the LS or the landing system button was pushed. Now when the plane started to pick up the signal from the localizer and the glide slope, the plane would be able to show the pilots the deviation from the localizer and the glide slope on the primary flight display. Pilots used this all day every day to make sure that they're lined up with the runway. Now, when the plane started picking up the signals from the glide slope, it was flickering above and below the 3 degree glide slope. This meant that the signal was unreliable. Now, you have to remember, at this point the plane was not lined up with the runway. The captain had to make a sharp 85 degree turn to line up with the runway. In the cockpit, he is worried that the turn would be too sharp for how fast the plane was, and that it might cause them to overshoot. All of this is pretty much normal. For the most part, the plane is right where it should be and the pilots are flying the plane pretty well. Well, except for one thing, the plane is higher than the 3 degree glide slope that the pilots should be flying. Looking at the flight data recorder, they found out that the plane never really captured the glide slope or the localizer. The data brought up a lot of questions. For example, when the plane was a beam of a waypoint called AMTAM, the signal told the pilots that they were well above the glide slope. But in actuality, the plane was below the glide slope. Their instruments, for some reason, was telling them the exact opposite of what was happening. This problem did not go away. Later, the instruments told the pilots that they were on glide, but in actuality, the plane was more than 850 feet below where they should have been. For the rest of the approach, until the go-around, the plane just kept falling and falling further away from the glide slope that they should have been on. But why? We still don't have a good idea as to why all of this was happening. What was different about this approach than all the other ones that were done at this airport by other A380s? The flight data told the investigators that these pilots were trying to do something known as a glide slope interception from above. Now usually you intercept the glide slope from below. You fly level, get on the localizer, then follow it all the way down to the runway. But these pilots were doing things the other way around. They were trying to get on the glide slope from above. Now, the difference might be subtle when written out like this, but intercepting a glide slope from above is vastly more difficult than intercepting it from below. It's a very precarious game of managing your airspeed, and if you do it wrong, you can fall very well below your glide slope. Now, here's one thing about an altitude interception from above. You have to be established on the localizer before you attempt it. That is to say that you have to be lined up with the runway. Now, these pilots had not intercepted the localizer when they started the procedure. This meant that when they did start picking up the signals from the runway for the ILS, they were outside what's known as the area of azimuthal coverage. Now, that sounds fancy and complicated, but it's basically the area where the signal from the ILS is the strongest. Usually, when pilots start using data from the ILS beacons, they are well within this area. But due to the way this approach had been flown, the pilots started using the information from the ILS when they were outside the azimuthal coverage region. Now, this is one problem. The data that you'd get from the instruments in the cockpit at this point would be unreliable. That's why their instruments told them that the plane was on glide when it was not. Then, 
After the plane had intercepted the glide slope, the first officer, who was the pilot flying, did not cross-check the data being given by the instruments. The first officer was taking the data from the instruments as gospel, when it should not have been taken as gospel in the first place. Now, all of that's perfect. That all makes sense. But why did they have to go around during the second approach? Did the same thing happen a second time? Well, during the second approach, the captain was using the DIR2 function and the flight management computer to get the plane to a specific waypoint. Well, the DIR2 function is basically what it sounds like, direct to. The plane flies directly to where it needs to go. But here's the thing, the direct to function on the flight management system has this sort of unintended consequence. It turns off the localizer and the glide slope capture modes in addition to the altitude hold and the navigation modes. It also disengaged the second autopilot. The plane basically stops everything else that it's doing and then just flies directly to the waypoint selected. Now, this obviously destabilized the plane to the extent where they had to go around and then try again. Luckily for the 400 plus people involved, the Airbus A380 was able to land back safely on the third try. Despite the Airbus A380 being one of the world's largest planes, period, it has an impressive safety record. The video that I made more than a year ago talks about how the plane lost an entire engine and still kept flying over the North Atlantic. If you want to watch that video, I'll leave it up for you on the screen right now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. And don't forget, Atlas VPN is 82% off with $1.99 a month. Catch you guys later.